Hey everyone, I'm Manar Mohawash and thank you again for tuning in to Mint Press News' Behind the Headline. We're a citizen-led project created in partnership with Free Speech TV. This show is made possible thanks to the over 300 citizen supporters and several business sponsors. Now to learn more about them, you can visit our website at mintpressnews.com. Now let's get Behind the Headline. The fog of war erupts in the confusion caused by the chaos of war. And in the media, it's an intentional phenomenon that makes it extremely difficult for the public to separate fact from fiction. And while the battles over war narratives evolve, they all have a common goal, to distort reality on the ground. And so is the case for the crisis in Syria and this new Cold War with Russia. But ultimately, a quick glance at history's most notorious propaganda could help us understand just how falsehoods can cause mass hysteria Area enough for the public to support the next war. Now take the build-up for President George Bush's support for Kuwait's humanitarian war against Iraq. On October 10, 1990, a 15-year-old Kuwaiti girl identified only as Nayara told the Congressional Human Rights Caucus that she witnessed Iraqi soldiers removing babies from incubators and leaving them on a cold floor to die. Now her testimony was cited by several senators and even President Bush as justification for backing Kuwait in the Gulf War against Saddam Hussein, which erupted just a few months later. However, it was later revealed that this young woman was the daughter of Kuwait's ambassador to the United States, and her testimony was arranged by a PR firm representing a Kuwaiti-sponsored group lobbying Congress for military intervention. More recently, during the Arab Spring uprisings that swept the Middle East in 2011 ahead of the U.S. bombing spree of Libya, Libyan media claimed that Muammar Gaddafi loyalists carried out mass Viagra-fueled rapes and that the Libyan leader had ordered rape as a weapon of war. When a prosecutor with the International Criminal Court opened an investigation into these allegations, it grabbed international headlines appearing in Al Jazeera, the BBC, and Reuters, among many other outlets. But even as Amnesty International questioned the legitimacy of the allegations, other supposedly humanitarian groups hit a loggerhead on the veracity of the claims. One top UN official said he believed the claims were met as a scare tactic to invoke mass hysteria even as another top UN official defended them, all creating a distraction from the war itself. But this mass hysteria became the justification for bombing the hell out of Libya and turning it into a failed state now overrun by groups like ISIS. And today, the fog of war is obscuring realities on the ground in Syria. Major news outlets frequently cite unnamed sources, a convenient way to manipulate public perception. From CNN to Reuters, these outlets are publishing unverified claims and providing minimal evidence to support them, while the public is supposed to drink it all up. Now, the crisis in Syria has attracted international attention and legitimate concern, and the corporate media is using the tragedies of war to push an interventionist agenda while boosting its audience. This push for content, no matter what, has serious consequences. On December 20th, for example, Egyptian police arrested five people for making videos they claimed were set in Aleppo, but they were actually filmed at a demolition site in that country. Social media further distorts reality on the ground, presenting a fragmented image of war as the media promotes only those whose accounts that align with the goals of the United States and its allies. Now, the media and public both accept the accounts of the White Helmets as gospel, yet that group, which purports to serve as a volunteer first responders in Aleppo, receives training from British mercenaries and funding from a PR firm tied to George Soros. Not only are the White Helmets making fake videos, but many of the responders have been even exposed as agents embedded with the Al Nusra Front and ISIS, armed and far from being impartial, even a recipient of millions of USAID funding. Whether the White Helmets are the first apolitical first responders they claim to be or not, one thing is clear. The narrative being weaved by and about them and others like them that are embedded with Al Qaeda have one agenda, support for US military intervention in the war in Syria. Now take other activists frequently cited by the media, like Bilal Abdul Karim, who is embedded with the Nusra Front, who glorifies suicide bombers. 
or Lina Shami, the young Syrian woman who promotes sectarian terrorists from Jaysh al-Sham, who threatened genocide against religious minorities as revolutionaries on her social media channels. It's time to put a critical lens to the propaganda in the news and social media. It's time to demand more than reporting that toes the government line and makes claims without any real evidence. And here to do just that is noted peace activist and author of War is a Lie and other books is David Swanson. Check it out. Thank you so much, David, for joining me today. I want to begin by talking about uh, the specific coverage that has been coming out of Aleppo because that reporting has been, you know, a story on its own. Who controls the narrative, uh, controls the public understanding of any war? Um, how has the propaganda worked in the case of Syria? Who controls that narrative? Well, I think maybe even more so than in some other wars because there are not uh, embedded reporters with militaries. There are not uh, a lot of reporters from outside uh, the area or reporters at all on the ground. Uh, and so people are getting information via social media uh, from sources that have no more knowledge of the situation on the ground than they themselves do. Uh, and uh, of course, the slant of the, the partisanship and the politics of those producing and packaging the news uh, is enormously shaping what you get. Uh, so, you know, of course, you can see through, you know, one story will refer to the liberation by the government and another to, you know, the, the fall to the regime. Uh, and you can interpret the facts as being the exact same thing in both stories. But uh, in other cases, you just cannot tell uh, unless you find uh, some reporter on the ground who you trust whether something has actually happened or not. Uh, and, uh, you know, that there is uh, an incredible push by certain parties, including uh, most U.S. media, uh, to paint the Syrian government uh, as evil to the greatest extent possible. Uh, and, of course, there is a great deal to work with there. Uh, and by others to uh, do the same for other parties. Uh, and so you have to take everything with a grain of salt. Uh, but here we have, you know, today a ceasefire being announced that looks more serious than past ceasefires. Seems like incredibly good news. Uh, but, but I expect, you know, parties in the U.S. to be spinning it as, as bad, uh, you know, peace being a bad thing because Russia is in favor of it. Uh, and, uh, it, you know, so you, you have to you, you have to try very hard to sort through and find uh, the facts because every side is using the incredible suffering as logic for increased militarism by their side. Uh, and so you're getting very little reporting uh, that is actually in the interests uh, of peace and de-escalation, uh, you know, and so you get exaggerated suffering on one party, exaggerated suffering by another party, uh, and minimizing the suffering uh, on, the, on the opposite sides by those same reports. It's, it's, very, it's very hard to sort through, um, but if, if you begin looking for what might reduce the violence, uh, you, can, uh, you can generally decipher what's happening uh, in, a, in a broad sense. And I want to talk about the humanitarian aspect here because, um, as you know, Syria has been painted as a humanitarian crisis that we need to intervene in. How have so-called humanitarian organizations or unnamed uh, officials played a role in manufacturing falsehoods about the crisis in Syria? increasingly humanitarian suffering uh, is more and more central to the packaging of wars uh, from the, the the fictional babies taken out of incubators and left on the floor before the Gulf War uh, to the uh, you know to the uh, arming of, of brutal terrorists by Iraq before the escalation of 03 to the need to rescue people on a on a mountaintop uh, from ISIS to the looming massacre uh, in Benghazi uh, prior to the to the overthrow and and murder of Gaddafi, uh, you know every single time. And, and in Syria, we have had claims of you know chemical weapons use by the Assad government uh, that have never been proven. We have had uh, people arrested last week in in Egypt for filming you know supposed footage of victims in Syria in Egypt. 
and, and that has been a, a phenomenon that we've seen uh, to a far greater extent in this war than any other I can recall. You know, sheer fictional dramatization of victims uh, and, you know, this recent a uh, phenomenon of people sending their final message before they die, uh, and then, of course, not dying in many cases, uh, thank goodness, and groups like the White Helmets, where, of course, there is some good being done, but they're being used uh, to dramatize one side of suffering in order to motivate increased militarism. It's, uh, you know, it's, it's something that it's very hard for people to see through without actually working at it, which is not what U.S. media consumers are are in the habit of doing. Right. And I'm glad you mentioned that because I want to talk a little bit more now about Russia, um, because Russia has been a stalwart ally of the Syrian government, and they've received a lot of criticism um, for their role in assisting, uh, the, in assisting Syria. Uh, much of the rhetoric we've seen used against Russia is now reminiscent of the Cold War and even language we've heard uh, recently against the axis of evil. Um, how has the vilification of Russia changed over the years and how much of it has stayed the same in your opinion? Even as the Cold War had supposedly ended uh, and this new enemy was held up, uh, you know, instead of China, which they were planning, it, it became terrorism. Uh, Muslim uh, Middle Eastern terrorists became the new big enemy. But now it, it really is been moved back to Russia uh, by the Obama administration, by Hillary Clinton, uh, by Hillary Clinton supporters who are now just openly proclaiming that the the strength and merit of their candidate is proven by the fact that uh, she couldn't be defeated without help from Russia. Never mind that there's been no proof whatsoever offered that there was any help from Russia. Uh, never mind that the alleged help from Russia uh, was the alleged uh, revelation that the primary was slanted in her favor by the Democratic Party. Uh, and, and so now we have this this intense demonization of Russia that has taken a form today of the Obama White House announcing new sanctions against Russians uh, and uh, kicking Russian spies out of the United States and closing Russian compounds and so forth. Uh, you know, on the same day that we have this announcement of a peace agreement uh, in Syria, you know, most Americans have no idea that the United States has been fending off and sabotaging attempts at peace settlements in Syria uh, from Russia for years now. Uh, and that this is another one that may see that same fate if there's not a big push to make it stick and get the United States on board. Because ceasing to arm terrorists in Syria uh, by the U.S. government is not part of the agreement and has to be. Uh, if it's going to work. Uh, and so you, you uh, have now uh, th th this inclination by Americans to oppose something if Russia's involved uh, and if Russia and Donald Trump are involved. And, you know, it's, it, it, it's very, very dangerous that, that this sort of partisanship is placed ahead of the question of war or peace, which ought to be primary. And David, now the war in Syria has taken a really interesting turn because now we see the media openly glorifying um, and cheerleading for al-Qaeda to basically overthrow the Syrian government and take power there. Um, why, was my, why must we remain uh, critical in our understanding of the Syrian war? You know, it, it, these are essentially al-Qaeda, essentially uh, an organization that the U.S. government and its uh, sidekick media had demonized for over a decade, uh, being held up as, you know, the enemy of the enemy. And yet th this agreement uh, already today is being reported in the U.S. media as well as other media uh, as potentially involving uh, Bashar al-Assad stepping down as was, uh, of course, part of an agreement uh, reportedly brushed aside without consideration uh, three years ago by the United States when Russia put it forward. So, you know, you will end up seeing that, of course, the U.S. aim is not, in fact, just getting rid of Assad, but getting rid of Russia's foothold in Syria. And so uh, this will not please everyone in Washington, uh, but it will please those who have managed to uh, to make Assad their primary enemy. 
uh, and if they can if they can get themselves away from the idea that that arming Al Qaeda uh, is is good for that cause and come to see a nonviolent settlement and humanitarian aid as good for that cause, that's all to the better. Thank you so much, David. David Swanson, author of War is a Lie and Peace Activist. Thank you so much. Uh, my pleasure. Thank you. Yemen has been devastated by asymmetrical aerial bombardment by a Saudi-led coalition, and the war on Yemen, along with a Saudi-imposed blockade, is having disastrous impacts on food and water security. The United Nations reports in October that more than half of Yemen's 28 million people are short of food. At least one and a half million children are going hungry in the poorest country on the Arabian Peninsula, including nearly 400,000 who are suffering from malnutrition so severe that it's weakening their immune systems. And these Saudi-led attacks continue, striking Yemen's hospitals, which are running out of medicine. All the while, these attacks have continued to receive backing from the United States, Israel, and the United Kingdom since they began on March 26, 2015. Even the New York Times admits that the deadly Saudi project in Yemen couldn't go on without U.S. support. But the Obama administration has said that while they may start halting some arms sales to Saudi Arabia, they're going to push ahead with training the Gulf Kingdom's air force to improve targeting. Now, the people of Yemen are without food, water, medicine, and fuel. The death toll in Yemen is so high that the Red Cross has started donating morgues to hospitals. And if that weren't enough, the military campaign has not only empowered Al-Qaeda to step into a vulnerable situation, it's actually made them richer, according to Reuters. Still, the Saudi government continues to block any kind of diplomatic solution in Yemen. Riyadh even threatened to cut funding to the UN over its inclusion on a list of children's rights offenders, effectively weaponizing humanitarian aid. Yet the crisis unfolding in Yemen goes routinely underreported in the mainstream media. Hard-hitting coverage is kept to a minimum by those controlling the narrative, namely outlets loyal to the U.S. and its allies which are enabling these atrocities. Now here to discuss the crisis in Yemen and what this war is really about is Catherine Shekdam, a political analyst, author, and director of programs with the Shafakna Institute for Middle Eastern Studies. She's also an expert on Yemen. A Tale of Grand Resistance, Yemen, the Wahhabi, and the House of Saud is her latest book, and in it she explores that real story of resistance against Saudi Arabia's influence on the impoverished state. Check it out. Catherine, thank you so much for joining me today. I want to begin by talking about uh, the backstory to the crisis in Yemen, because the situation there has been rapidly declining. Now much of the population is facing um, famine that will undoubtedly impact the health and development of the country's youngest generation, but most people don't even know how this conflict got started. Tell us about that. When it comes to figures and, you know, the, the tally that is coming out, it depends, you know, who you're listening to. So, for example... The United Nations has given, you know, different figures. For example, um, you know, they talked about 7,000 dead and then it went up to 9,000, 10,000, 11,000. Um, but for example, the Shafakna Institute has actually, you know, done an independent research working with the Munar Relief Organization. Uh, and they have found that so far we have been able to account 15,000, um, you know, civilian deaths. Uh, we're not talking about, you know, those who are actually, um, you know, who died in the front line. We're just talking about civilians. Uh, and this, of course, doesn't account, you know, for, you know, those who died, um, you know, from famine or, you know, from, uh, I would say, uh, you know, collateral damage from the war, you know, for example, you know, lack of medicine and things like this. Because in this case, we're talking, um, you know, maybe 40, 50,000 people. Um, so it really depends how and who you include in those figures. And of course, I think that a lot of it has redacted and kind of manipulated in a way that people don't feel horrified. Um, you know, if, if you recall just a few years ago, people were talking about 26 million people in Yemen. Now the UN is actually registering 24 million. Um, so if you just do the calculation and the math, uh, you realize there's a kind of like a two million deficit where those two million people went. We're not quite sure. Uh, and there's always this fear that they actually you know those people are actually dead, but not accounted for. Uh, and that's the problem. You know, there's three million, um, you know, internally displaced, uh, displaced people right now in Yemen who are living uh, in dire condition. We're talking about living in caves. Uh, people's homes and hospitals and schools and mosques have been completely obliterated and they have literally nowhere to go. Um, so when we talk about the situation in Yemen, I cannot stress enough how dire it is and how speakably bleak it is. Saudi Arabia and its coalition has done everything it can 
to completely obliterate Yemen's civil institutions and, and Yemen, I would say, um, as a nation state, because there is nowhere in Yemen you could actually walk into and not face the catastrophe of war. And we're talking absolute devastation. Uh, if you look, I think if you wanted to understand what Yemen looks like today, you would have to look at Aleppo, for example, to kind of have an idea of the, the degree um, of destruction that Saudi Arabia has rained onto Yemen. And I'm talking about hysterical bombing, obliteration of land, of agricultural land, of hospitals, of, you know, power grid. Everything that is actually standing up is not in ashes because Saudi Arabia wished it so. And the world is completely oblivious because Yemen, of course, is sitting under a media blackout and no one is really interested in hearing what the Yemeni have to say because Yemen is one of the most impoverished nations in Saudi Arabia and who cares about Yemen and who cares about you know, the voice of the oppressed. Um, and I know that it sounds like a cliche, but it, it is a reality. Yemen is not being heard. People are not giving the courtesy of their own truth um, and their, their political future. You know, Yemen has already spoken against this war many times over. They have spoken against those who wish to draw it and still people, the world is not hearing them. Right. And I'm, you know, I'm, I'm glad you talked about the dynamics and it is definitely a complex situation. But like any war, um, there's always economic interests um, um, that feed into the narrative and the agenda of these wars. So how much of this conflict has to do with oil, uh, for example, or the military industrial complex um, and U.S. corporate empire um, and profits in general? Uh, I do believe that what the U.S. is trying to do is actually spend um, the Saudi financially by really you know, um, selling them as much as possible and kind of setting them up for failure because they realize that Yemen will be uh, Saudi Arabia, Vietnam. But of course, they're making billions of dollars uh, on the back of the Saudi. And it makes sense for war capitalists back in Washington. You know, they make money. Who cares? They don't really care who dies in the process. It doesn't make sense. It doesn't actually, uh, it's not relevant to them. Um, the blood of the innocent, again, doesn't bother them that much as long as they make, um, you know, they, they make them line. Now, the other thing that I believe we need to really pay attention to is the fact that Saudi Arabia has been, you know, promoting Wahhabism in Syria and in Iraq to kind of, you know, propel different radical groups, you know, like Al-Nusra or Boko Haram, for example, in Nigeria and, and, and other places in the world. Um, now, I do believe that it's, it's a form of deflection, I would say, because Saudi Arabia has always had its eye on Yemen. The problem is it couldn't exactly declare war on this one country because then, of course, where would have you know, um, I think, you know, took offense and said, well, you can't exactly declare war on a country just because you feel like it. Um, you know, you would have had to have um, special, I would say, circumstances kind of be set up for the world to look away. And of course, with Syria and Iraq, the world is literally looking away and is more preoccupied with what is happening with Daesh um, than it is about Yemen. Because again, who cares about Yemen? The problem with Yemen that it might be the most, you know, the poorest nation in Southern Arabia, it nevertheless sits at a very key strategic uh, crossroads in terms of, you know, geopolitics, anything atop the world or route. Uh, why is this important? Well, essentially, because if Saudi Arabia is actually to take control of Yemen, then they would have a monopoly over all the, you know, uh, natural resources of the world. And we all know that it would essentially mean that Saudi Arabia would be able to dictate certain agenda to Western powers, but not just Western powers, I would say the world entirely. So you would, you know, if, if you can kind of make uh, a correlation, if you look at how, you know, the UN was actually blackmailed by Saudi Arabia earlier this year, you can only imagine what the kingdom would do if it was given, you know, the key to the world all route and how very much uh, tyranny could be over world politics. Now, I very much doubt that the US is not aware of this reality. I think that they do understand this. Um, but what they're doing is actually spending Saudi Arabia, the same that they spent Iraq, if you recall, you know, um, when they decide to fund Saddam Hussein's war against Iran, you know, before they actually flipped against his, his regime. Um, I think that we really need to kind of look into history and understand that, you know, this kind of games that are being played today, those alliances that we see shaping are not forever, that we need to kind of look past short term and understand that the Saudi are being set up. They are actually well overdue for a revolution. They have uh, today is like 53 or, or almost 54 billion uh, dollar deficit. They can't continue to fund war. They can't continue to, you know, silence the world by throwing billions of dollars um, at various parties. Um, you know, something's going to have to give. And if I would say Syria is anything to kind of, you know, judge by, you know, Yemen is set up, um, you know, will be victorious because the Yemeni people have no choice but to defeat Saudi Arabia, because otherwise it's actually the death of them, quite literally. They understand that, and so they will be fighting. Now, the problem is they are standing by themselves because other 
countries such as Iran and Russia, for example, are already politically invested in Syria and in Iraq. And they can't possibly take a chance on Yemen now because it would be too, um, you know, they would overspend politically. And so they had to make a choice. But again, I think that Saudi Arabia was actually planning on this, which is why it first set up Syria and Iraq as the main war theater in the greater Middle East, so that the people, first of all, powers would not invest in Yemen. Second, media would not look at Yemen, and that people would maybe not pay attention to what it is that they're trying to do, which is essentially take control over Arabia to then propel, you know, this kind of hegemonic Wahhabist agenda. Um, and I think that we need to really pay attention to this. You need to understand what it is that is coming out of the mouth of Saudi clerics in Saudi Arabia. We never really listen to what it is that say and the kind of idea that they're promoting and that they're promoting not only in the country, in their country, but outside. Because, you know, in England, for example, 90% of all the most Islamic centers are being funded by Saudi Arabia. So if you imagine what Wahhabi, you know, what Daesh militants are saying, for example, in Syria and Iraq, you have to understand that the same narrative is being played out in the US, in the UK, in France and other countries across the world. We need to ask ourselves the question, do we really want to look at Yemen and not understand that what is happening in Yemen could happen anywhere else in the world if given the chance, if we allow this to continue to do what it is that they do today? And Catherine, there's obviously a major media blackout on the crisis in Yemen, unlike other crises that we see uh, constantly being covered, like in Syria or elsewhere. How can we disrupt the mainstream media blackout on Yemen and help mobilize action um, against U.S. involvement, specifically for their direct role in basically allowing this conflict to even happen? Yemen is not is not on. It has nothing to do with Iran. We need to 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 stop, you know, giving into those labels and and to try to actually look at countries and understand that if we claim ourselves, you know, d you know, we claim democracy for ourselves, we claim freedom for ourselves. Can we please give other people, other nations, the same courtesy? This is all the Yemeni are asking for. They're asking for political self determination. So we need to kind of up our, our high horses and stop judging them on account of their poverty or maybe the fact that they're not Western as we would like them to be. Those people are actually entitled to their history and their identity. We have to respect this. If we're actually serious about democracy and international law, we're talking about respect today. But respect comes by respecting the truth. Yemen is entitled to its truth. We ought to listen to its people and end, you know, our perpetual kind of, you know, I would say, over analysis where we're actually speaking over the Yemeni people. They are entitled to speak up and we need to listen. When we do this, I think that dynamics will change. Well, thank you so much, Catherine. Catherine Shekdam, author and expert on Yemen. Thank you. My pleasure. Well, thank you again for joining me today. Make sure to tune in next week for another dose of real news. In the meantime, the conversation continues on Facebook and on Twitter at Minar MUH. See you then.